Jim, our next question sent once again to the Cults of Cornette Facebook group. This was sent by Rick Beerbauer. Who taught Jim Rick, is- Rick Beerbelly? Rick Beerbauer. According to this, he's a rising contributor on the Cult of Cornette Facebook page, whatever that means. A rising contributor? Has he got a little chubby now, or what? Will you leave him alone? What is your problem with everyone today? If, Here's if his he's question. he's got a beer belly, how can he tell whether he's got a little well, lead in his pencil? He's not a beer belly. He's Beer Bauer. And let's go to Beer Bauer's question here. Beetle bomb. Who taught Jim his working punch? It's almost reminiscent of Scott Hall or The Rock, <laughs> in my opinion. Okay, I don't see that, because uh, for one thing, they both did that open hand bullshit. Uh, nobody sat me down one day and said, little Jimmy, today we're going to do the punch. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm going to re <laughs> reveal this wisdom to you. But I grew up watching Jerry Lawler and Jackie Fargo from the time I was 10 years old or whatever. And I'm managing Bobby Eaton. And there was also something to be said for Terry Funk, who I was a huge fan of. And all those guys, you know, you you kind of absorb things by osmosis if you pay attention to what they're doing. And, and I just kind of, you know, put that into what I was doing. And it got to the point where by the, by the time that all those guys were uh, gone from the business, and I was about ready to be gone from the business. I was a 50-year-old guy throwing the most credible-looking fucking punch in the goddamn wrestling industry. But just because nobody else... Uh, a lot of these guys just do it as a thing to do while they're talking to somebody. I'm going to punch you five times in the face while you're backing up and I'm calling a spot and I'm paying more attention to what we're going to do than what we're actively doing. But if the whole idea of every time you do it is to draw back and throw something and simulate the contact as much as possible and follow through with your body and get as much out of it as you can and not think five steps ahead, then it's, it's easier to do. And you've also got to not have somebody that's covering up. Because remember we talk about all these guys, now they get on top of a guy and they turtle up into a ball and they just throw windmill punches at their general direction and nothing lands and everything looks fake. You got to have an open target and that guy's got to trust you from night after night of doing it that he's not going to knock your fucking teeth out. I work with Bobby Fulton so much, the Fantastics thing, that I'd, at any point I could just feed over to Bobby and just be leaning over with my, with my chin out. And I knew that he would nail me from any fucking angle and it would never hurt. And there'd be contact enough for me to fucking sell. And I wouldn't think of blocking it because that would throw his fucking aim off. But the thing, nobody blocked shit when guys knew how to work. But now that they're just throwing kicks and punches in the general direction of their goddamn face, maybe I don't blame them for blocking shit. The way you said you learned how to do it from watching Memphis wrestling, and when you look at Jeff Jarrett, who I think throws one of the best punches, yeah, it's reminiscent of what you would see based on what you saw, the things he grew up watching. But it's interesting, you know, beyond throwing a punch at someone's face and for the most part not hitting them, what about the legwork, the footwork, how you move? I love how Jeff Jarrett, again, reminiscent of classic Memphis wrestling, he reaches down and comes up with it. Yeah. And I think that's one of the key things that makes it look so good, but it's also his feet as he's doing it. What are the other intangibles? Well, yeah, it's, it's the follow-through also, and whereas Jeff reaches down and comes up with it, if you'd notice Bobby Eaton strike like a cobra, he would come from around the right side, and it'd be more level but under the chin, where there'd be a little... <laughs> and yes, if you're right-handed, which most people are, when you start off, your left foot's in front of you. Your right foot is, is kind of to the back because your weight is on your right leg. And as you're drawn back with your right hand, and as you start throwing the punch, you're shifting your weight from your right foot to your forward foot, your left foot, and you're also turning somewhat at the waist because your shoulders 
have to follow through with this also. Remember, Luger would stand there and do a little square-shouldered box punch where it would be like his shoulders were still completely squared off straight in front of the guy and his arm would just go in front of him. But if you're throwing a fucking big football pass, right? Your right arm is back, your left arm's in front, your shoulders are sideways and your body rotates at the waist and your arm comes to your shoulder to turn. You're throwing a punch, same thing. Boom! And that way, a lot of your follow-through convinces people that you've you've struck your target also. Of course, they're doing it. The Solo's doing it now where they do the fucking thing with the open hand and then he does a little bobble move and and throws his hand out like he's following through but there was a there was a pause have you seen that one yes and that calls attention to the fact that he didn't follow through he paused <laughs> and then he did it to make you think that he did it and so but that's the it's your whole body you put your whole body into it the body language you not only put your whole body into selling when you're selling but you put your whole body into your offense when you're on offense if you're kicking a guy with your right foot you're not just kicking him you're again your right foot goes back your left foot's in front then you bring your right foot in and when you throw the kick and snap it at the guy at the same point your left foot comes a little bit up off the mat and stomps a little bit just to make a little noise and at the same time, your hands go to your sides like you're throwing everything into the goddamn kick, unless you're hanging onto the top rope where you're really digging in with the kicking. And you're pulling yourself in with your body at the same time. But there's never just a one limb movement to any of this stuff, or there shouldn't be. But those punches, too, I think of the, the camera angle, the far one in the Memphis Mid South Coliseum watching Lawler. You know, throw punches like that. They're like the perfect kind of punches to get the fans up. I don't know how to say it any better. Like, yeah, they're to get a big woo from the crowd when you throw the punch. It's the move, the way they move. Jeff Jarrett, Jerry Lawler. It's the perfect way to throw. Well, the and punch. it all it all comes from Fargo, from that big arena body, whole full body selling type of thing. When he would start making a comeback, and he would start throwing those punches. But that's also the thing is that the people would whoo because the the timing of the babyface making the comeback is important. And when they get used to him, then they can they can go with it because Lawler's, if he threw three punches and then the big one, he would still be reaching back and throwing it whoom, whoom. Boom! And then he'd grab the guy by the hair so he could lift the, the fist in the air and show the people and milk the anticipation. And then the big one, boom! And there would be the same amount of time in between the first three wombs, so they had time to do it, right? It was like he was a conductor <laughs> leading the orchestra, but instead of the band, it was with punches. And it all timed where you, boom! 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 And boom! You know, I forget what the exact clip is, and I'm sure you'll know. But I always love the clip of uh, from the Mid South Coliseum once again. But it was from the floor. Uh, Fargo is punching Lawler in the corner. I think Fargo's in street clothes. But every time yes. he punches him, he looks at his hand, and then yes. he punches him again, and he look at his hand to see what's on his hand. And that was 1976 in the Coliseum. It was Mike Shields on the floor camera at that point in time, and. That was one of the times where Fargo had either been injured or been out of the territory and then came to the big angle, and the big program was in 74, but he came back in 76 and had another series of matches that were instigated by him being in the corner of the babyface and blah, blah, blah. So that was Fargo when he'd been in the corner of, God damn, I'm trying to think who it was at this point, but it doesn't matter had come in the ring to, you know, fucking kick the shit out of Lawler and set up they were going to work the following week. But that's the thing is, when when Fargo would throw those, he had a different stance to it, but he would cock his fist back and he would throw a straight right hand to the guy's head and it looked like a, just a jab to the forehead. And boom, every time he'd hit him, like you said, he'd look at his hand like, shit, did I break my knuckle? Boom, oh, shit. And... <laughs> 
the eye that they had for detail and distance and accuracy was incredible, but that was the the most important part of a baby faces game. They could wrestle all night long, but when the time came for the comeback, the people wanted to see the baby face punch that fucking heel right in a goddamn mouth. And that's what got the reaction. And every time, I mean, this was, was not uh, limited to the Mid-South Coliseum, but in those days, every time the baby face would finally start the comeback, every time he'd hit the fucking heel with a punch, the whole crowd would go, ooh, woo, woo, and you, it was, you know, it was the biggest reaction of the match. That's what they waited to see. 